it's too good of a, a passage, uh, chapters 17 to 20. It's too good, I think, to blow through in one week. So we'll, um, we'll pray and then start looking at chapter 17 and uh, see what popped out in your notes in your mind this morning. Father, thank you for these notes that uh, Solomon wrote down. Uh, Lord, they're not meant to be a, a book, a book of poetry. They are in the, um, uh, the Nevi'im, the writings of the Jewish people. But I uh, thank you that he sat down and wrote maybe a, a daily journal or as things popped into his mind. I know you led him at these things. Uh, otherwise, the, the, uh, the wise rabbis and sages would not have prayed and seen that this was your inspired word. Uh, but it's not random. Um, I pray that you'll help us to connect these things to our own lives. And um, even as we finish up on up into the 1st of October, that we'll be able to organize these things in a way that would be teachable, that we could teach others, maybe even instruct our, our grandkids in these uh, great pieces of wisdom and warnings uh, from this great King of Israel. Thank you for your kindness and and your love to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, chapter 17. What do you have from chapter 17? Hi, Mary. Mary, we're doing the Proverbs for four chapters a week, and uh, everybody reads them ahead of time. And at least three or four people write some notes and have comments. No, some people just things pop out at them and, and we comment on them and get some discussion started. And uh, we're starting with chapter 17 this morning. Um, all right, who'd like to be first? I'm going to let you go first and then I'll tell you what I've got connected in chapter 17. Jim. Samuel uh, going to the house of Jesse looking for uh, the new king. Uh, basically, uh, found, he found out that uh, God looks on the hearts of men and uh, not as men do. So in 17.3, uh, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. It's interesting that you reference that passage back where, where um, the prophet was looking to anoint God's king. Because I just looked at that same passage this week, and that was that's a, a neat statement. God says, "I test the hearts," and you made that connection right there with verse three. Uh, there's another. I think there's another. Um, there are. There are a number during the, the reading of all the Proverbs, there are a number of times that he talks about um, God in relation to a king. And I wonder if he was trying to help his people with instruction for the future kings, too. I don't know. but uh, And he knew, probably was, was fairly old by this time, and knew that, that even when he, like we all do, when, when we think we're faking people out, now God test the heart, and if we test him, he'll reveal to others the secrets of our heart. You know, it's, it's so much better when God pricks our heart about something that, that we're doing wrong, something that's offensive to him, something that's interfering with our relationship to him. It's so much better when we stop and say, oh, Lord, thank you, Lord, for, for reminding me of that. Sorry, got to work on that now. Because if we keep pushing it back, pushing it back, covering it up, then sometimes when he reveals it, he lays it all out there for everybody to see. And it would be so much better if we took care of it ourselves in private between us and him and possibly between us and anybody else that we have uh, offended or anybody else that saw us do that sin. Um, 
there's a there's a problem that people have sometimes in confessing private sin publicly. Um, I think that the Bible is clear that if if sin is in my heart, okay, I need to confess it and forsake it. As soon as I realize from the Word of God and the Spirit of God that it's wrong, okay. If if anyone else was affected by that, if if the sins in my heart were seen by somebody else, felt by somebody else, they affected somebody else in a negative way. And it couldn't be in a good way because sin doesn't affect people in a good way. But if there is an outworking, a public um, dimension to my sin, then I need to confess it publicly. Then I need to, if it wasn't something that all the class knew about, maybe it was something that only uh, Jim and Eddie knew about, then I go to them privately and say, guys, I did this. And sometimes um, people are, ha have come to me and said, you know, I didn't mean to offend you. I said this or that. And um, I said, thank you. Thank you for, for coming and telling me that. Um, because, you know, it did hurt and it does it does mend our relationship that you came and talked to me. And it's not the easy thing to do. It, it's not. Um, but so the one who knows the hearts um, speaks to us first about it. But then for somebody else, we need to speak to. And that is a, an important part of the mending process. Um, there are there are certain programs in the world today, rehab programs we call them, that have biblical principles in it. And I know that AA and Narconics Anonymous has the principle in it of going back and making amends, confessing, asking forgiveness, and making amends with the people that we have wronged. I've been on the receiving end of that. Um, some friends of ours um, had uh, one of their kids had done some some really, really awful things against themselves and against the parents and against some others that were close to family too. And um, this, this friend of mine said, I really knew that, that, that my, my daughter's heart had changed when she went back and began to confess and repent these things. She had real remorse in her heart and ask our forgiveness. And uh, so it, it was, there's a healing effect inside to it, but it also heals relationships when we do that. Um, thanks, Jim. That's a good, good point. The, the Lord tests the hearts. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Rick. How about uh, friend loves at all times? Okay. There are there are three passages, three verses that I marked in in yellow highlighter uh, because they're 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 gold to me, and that was one of them. Rick, uh, a friend loves at all times. The other the other half of that though is that uh, a brother is uh, born for adversity, and I think of my brother mm -hmm. really watches after me and comes to see me regularly, calls me regularly. And uh, it's been a real blessing for me over these past four years. Wow, cool. Yeah. Um, and that's how you can tell. Sometimes it has to be an adverse time before you can really tell uh, the depth of friendship, uh, the loyalty of your friends. Um, they, they don't, you know, even when we're, we're wrong, they don't run off. They don't take the safe way out. They don't justify what we've done. But, but they are there for adversity in our lives. And he loves at all times, uh -huh. regardless whether we messed up or not. Unconditional. That, that's just like the Father's love. Yeah. Um, I remember um, Roger and Joy in their teaching that month a couple of years ago when they taught 
uh, four Sundays on emotions. I remember them talking about the importance of loyal love, um, the love that's in the Psalms, said faithfulness, it's translated sometimes. And they talked about the importance of that loyal love to your kids uh, during the worst of times and the best of times. By the way, I'm going to put a plug in here for the pastor and his wife. I was one of the only people at Grace that wasn't here. I was gone for like almost two weeks on the road. The, the, over the five days that he came back and did that, it was something like Wednesday through Sunday, all the interviews with all the committees and then the messages and the question and answer and all that stuff. And uh, there weren't, you know, a lot of people were, but the good thing was they, they uh, videoed it. And when I got back from that trip, I watched every minute of every video. And I immediately, and I told Pastor this too, I immediately picked up on the fact that when, when she was answering questions, I looked at the look on his face and he was so proud of her. Oh, man. And then I looked at, at her when he was speaking and she was so proud of him. And I told him that. I said, man, I didn't see you. I didn't know you. But I looked for the kind of relationship that you had with your wife. And I saw both of you just being so proud of each other and loving each other. And I said, that, that told me you were the man that we needed to be our shepherd. And uh, he, you know, you know, all embarrassed and everything. I said, no, man, that's... That's awesome. And it, and it still is. That was funny, though. I almost knew Tina was going to do that when he went down and kissed his wife and was hugging on her. <laughs> but uh, that was just good stuff. Um, all right. A friend loves at all times. I connected that with two other verses, 1810 and 1824. A man who has friends <clears throat> must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Um, two things that that verse means to me. Sometimes you will find a brother or in your lady's situation, a sister who is closer than your natural born sister. Um, or as close as if that was your natural born sister. I said to somebody one time, I said, Ron and I, uh, Ron's my best friend from up Ohio. And I said, Ron and I are like brothers, but we never had to share a room growing up. <laughs> I said, maybe that's why we love each other even more than some brothers do. We've never fought or anything. And, and we're total opposites. I mean, he's, you know, he, he, will, he would eat an elk burger, but, but not ask where it came from. You know, I would want to know where it came from, you know. So um, the friend, but it also reminds me of Jesus. I mean, there's nobody that is closer to a human being than him. Uh, no matter what sacrifices anybody has ever made for us in our life, th there's nobody closer than him. Anybody who has put himself out there more than him. The third verse that I tied in with this, it, it doesn't, it's a special you might think it's unrelated, but I don't think it is. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, 1810. The righteous run to it, and they are safe. Um, the interesting thing is the best kind of friend that you can have, the one that will stick closer than a brother, is someone who knows the Lord because they will remind you about him. They will remind you of things that, that maybe in the heat of the moment you have forgotten about him, how special he is, how awesome he is. And then you will do the same for them. And they will, they will also call you up if you, need to, if you need someone to straighten you out a little bit. They'll do it because they love you. They love you too much not to. Um, uh, in the past, a, a, a kid much younger than me, said one of the wisest things I've heard about relationships. He said, you've got to love somebody enough to be willing to risk your relationship with them if that's what it takes to make them better, to rebuke them, to humbly say to them, hey, this is what the Word of God says about what you're doing or what you're thinking right now. You've got to be willing to 
to risk that relationship because you love them more than being close. And then, and then I'd add this to it. Uh, being close is better than being right. When you have disagreements with somebody, uh, maintaining a close relationship with somebody is better than having them say you're right. Uh, they'll figure it out later that you're right. So <laughs> maybe after we're gone. Okay. Um, thanks, Rick. Uh, we didn't have, I didn't find any uh, just stop it in these. Rick, I'm sorry, man. Are there some just do it in there? Yeah, just do it. Yeah, there are some just do it. Yes, there are. <laughs> okay, back in 17. Back in 17. Some good stuff in there. Children's children is the crown of old men. I would add for Jim, even if they poke you in the eye. <laughs> Grandkids. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else have anything else from 17? Actually, 28 is almost a just stop it. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent. Stop talking. Yeah. The discerning when he seals his lips. My dad used to tell me, don't. Don't waste an opportunity to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste an opportunity to shut up. Okay, I, I that's that memorable. Most most of what our parents, the memorable things from our parents, especially somebody else told them too. And I, um, a couple of weeks ago, I said to Beth, you know, you've heard me say that my dad said this, but when I get to thinking about it. I don't know if he really said that or not, or did did I make that up? I don't know, but it sounds like something he would say because I'm a lot like my dad. But uh, yeah, so there, say that again so we can, if anybody wants to write it down. What dad said? Yeah, it's what dad uh, said. Don't miss a good opportunity to shut up. Don't miss a good opportunity to shut up. Okay, all you people that are watching this by video, write that down, okay? <laughs> You've never had to say that to Doug, have you? No, he's quiet. <laughs> He's a quiet guy. Renee? I, I don't know if exactly how this quote goes, so if you'd help me, but even fools are thought wise if they've kept silent or if they remove, if they speak, it removes all doubt. Uh -huh. They are fools yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> when they speak. Abraham Lincoln pulled that out. Okay, I think it, I'm saying it wrong. Back yes, there. that's what he said. You know, you know, open your mouth and remove all doubt, or yeah. whether you're a fool or not. Um, okay. Uh, my son used to say that he could tell who was right in an argument um, because if you're right, you don't have to yell or use sarcasm to belittle the other person. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Learn from your kids. Write down the things that your kids say too. Okay, we have wise kids, don't we, dear? And we know where they got it from. The talking, we know where they got that from, too. But we know where they got the wisdom. Okay. Uh, yeah, Andy. Uh, verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. See, I'm not a person because I never knew my father. I spent a little time with him. He was never, well, being a children's army, he used to come every now and then. But we never conversed about anything. Mm -hmm. And you, you totally flipped that by being an honorable father, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, yes you did. You did, Andy. And you're, if your kids were here, they'd both be screaming and clapping because that's... Oh, well, it is. Yes, that's why they give you a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> they want to make sure you're still you still got your spunk, Andy. Uh, okay, all right. Anybody else? Joyful heart is good medicine. Yep, yep. Have a good laugh. Um, have a, a, a have a good laugh. Yeah. But a broken spirit dries up the bones. That's right. Um. Medical tests, doctors will tell you, you know, um, from here up has a lot to do with how you heal, how you survive, 
um, you know, that you cannot separate this body, okay, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual. It's a package deal. And that's why encouraging somebody, blessing somebody, um, if you were um, if you were at the memorial service, both of them, uh, Rogers and Joys, but especially Rogers, uh, Roger Jr. got up at the end, and I sent the video out to you. If you haven't watched it yet, please watch it. It's it's about 40, 45 minutes. Roger Jr. gave a blessing personally to each of the members of the family. He had already said a word of blessing to the folks from Grace, to folks from our Sunday school class, to the folks from Rosewood. But then he named each person and said, this is what you meant to dad. This is what I've heard him say about you. And that was right in the middle of, you know, people smiled. And that's it, it, a, a merry heart. And it's not just stupid, frivolous laughing. It's, it's real joy and fun laughing are good for the body, good for the soul. Um, okay. All right. Anybody else for 17? Don? I, I, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, I'm looking at verse 18. Okay. I've got these two very different versions. One is kind of a little bit lengthy, and the other one's just very quick and to the point. One who has no sin <coughs> shakes hand in pledge and puts up security for a neighbor. And then this other ver uh, version says, it's stupid to guarantee someone else's loan. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that when I was young, younger, back in back in Decatur, uh, I, I had asked Donna's father if he would be willing to put his name as a signature for uh, on my loan. And he did. You know, I was so thankful. Uh, apparently, he was able to use the wisdom to see that I was willing to pay the loan off and still stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Verse 18 is a man devoid of understanding shakes hands in a pledge. I think the thought there is without even thinking about it. He didn't, he, it, there wasn't any wisdom involved, but there was involved in the man who stood up yeah. for you and stood with you. And so there is a difference between uh, being stupid about it, which the one translation is, and uh, not only being wise in it, but but having it to be like an investment or a blessing to you. He says, you know, by him doing that, he was showing confidence in you. And man, when somebody shows confidence in you, you have more confidence in yourself too. You say, well, maybe I can do this. That's a good. That's a good thing. All right, thank you, man. All right, anybody else for seventeen? All right, if you're going to mark the verses, um, and I've done this every time, I'm tying together all the verses, the phrases about foolishness. Uh, my plan is um, at the end of our study, we'll probably take an extra week or two, and um, I'm hoping to be able to print up Dr. Price's um he did not an outline of Proverbs, but he pulled out different subjects and put all the references together. He tied them together sort of like we're doing it, the different subject lines. And it'll be interesting to look at that and see if there are any that we have overlooked or missed, maybe while we're looking at all the multitude of verses about dumb people, uh, fools, you know, however you want to call them. But uh, verse 17, and by the way, I, somebody mentioned, I think maybe it was Eddie a week or two ago, all of us have done some of these dumb things, okay? <laughs> we all, you know, go through the whole book of Proverbs, and there's going to be an ouch moment for every one of us, maybe more than one. And sometimes we've, sometimes we've repeated, what is it they say, uh, foolishness is, is um, repeating the same bad habit and expecting a different outcome, <laughs> but we've done that. But nobody in here has taken a lot of these on, um, and I'm thankful for that. All right, I got verse 2, um, a son who causes shame. Verse 4, he, give e he gives heed to false lips, listens eagerly 
to a spiteful tongue. Um, there are there are some people. Uh, there are some people when they when they come up on um, on TV, uh, the mute button. Beth is the fastest mute button in the West. Okay, I mean she can mute it before I even think about muting. She. Goes, Phew. In fact, she said one time that was the good part about me doing these videos. You could mute me. <laughs> so, that was back when. That was back during 2020. <laughs> but anyhow. <laughs> but you know, it's funny when I when I when I quote any of these sing, memorable things or say any of these things about Beth. Nobody says no, no, no. She wouldn't say that. They all know that she would. <laughs> She's confessing right now. She's telling me she said it. I, I know. I just confess it. So. I just don't yeah, well, I do. I remember this. <laughs> this is good stuff. Okay. Um, um, okay. Uh, a liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Why would you want to do that unless you were foolish? Uh, verse 5, they mock the poor. Um, they are glad at calamity. Um, you think about it, in the last, oh, back since 2020, the most vicious, uh, unspeakable, unthinkable, violent things that happen on TV, so many of them are, are homeless people getting beat up, uh, defenseless people, women and children, or elderly people getting